beginning in verse 7. Oh, I like this text. That can be dangerous. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? A group of kids were asked the question, how long does it take to get an answer to prayer? Some of my favorites. It takes four years to get your prayer answered. I know because I asked for a dog when I was three. And I just got one. <laughs> God takes only one day to answer your prayer in the summer, and eight days to answer in the winter. Only he takes forever if you ask him for a Barbie doll. <laughs> I prayed for a boa constrictor, but I never got one. I think that's because my mom hates snakes, and she's prayed longer than I have. <laughs> you really want to know how long it takes? Okay, I'll tell you. Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows. So why does it take so long to get an answer sometimes? Well, God can't do everything in a flash, can he? One kid said, you have to wait until you're dead to get to heaven so he can tell you the answer. <laughs> Another kid said, that's for true. It takes a very long time to get your prayer answered. It doesn't take God very long to do something about it. But it takes a long time for your words to travel through the sky and get to God. <laughs> Almost everybody asks him at once, so it takes about a week to get through. <laughs> then it takes 24 hours to make your wish come true, because he's open 24 hours a day. <laughs> but then, even after your wish is true, he still has to send it down to you. But my favorite one of all, when you ask God something, you don't like to do it right away for some reason. That's his own business. But if you wait, you'll get there. A lot of truth to that little child's statement. This is one of my favorite texts because in it, God gives us three commands and three promises and then he shows us that it all rests on the goodness of his character. That prayer is all about a God who is good and loving and he is, despite our, the imperfections of our own parents, he's the perfect Heavenly Father. He's the good one, and he can be trusted. He's not going to give you a snake if you ask him for a fish, and he's not going to give you, what, a rock if you ask for bread. No, he's good. And he's always got in mind your best. This is the wonderful confidence that we have when we come to God in prayer. So let's first of all take a look at the commands and the promises that go with the commands, because they go together. The first command that Jesus gives us, it, this is an imperative, it's a present case imperative in the Greek, as if that matters to you. And what that means is that you ask and you keep on asking. The first one is ask. And present tense, you don't give up. You keep on asking. Sometimes you'll get the answer right away, and sometimes you have to keep on asking. But in any case, the first command is ask, which I call simple prayer. Um, simple prayer. Um, asking is the most simple, most basic form of prayer, says Wesley Duell. Asking is the level where most all prayer and intercession begins. Asking is the foundation of all prevailing in prayer. It's not that God doesn't know what you need, but he delights in you coming to him in faith. And there's something about that building relationship with God that comes through prayer that is at the heart of why I think God tells us, when you have a need, ask me about it. 
ask and keep on asking. Jesus has taught us in just the previous chapter that we should pray, give us this day our daily bread, right? The most basic necessities of life, the most basic things of life, we ought to ask God for those things. We ought to trust God for those things. He knows that we need them, but He delights in our coming to Him, just as a father delights when their little child comes and asks. So He delights in us. How do we ask? Um, and what, what kind of, what are we talking about here when we're asking this way? I think what Jesus is saying here is ask, ask simply, ask plainly, and ask specifically. Um, ask in such a way that you know that if you get an answer, have you ever prayed prayers and they were so bland and general that you wouldn't know if you got the answer? I have. But when you pray specifically about something, and you keep track of it, you'll often find that God answers in very specific ways that are sure indicators to us that we ought to be thankful and praise God for it. I think he also, it's as Jesus teaches in other places, that we need to ask boldly and in faith. God is desires us to come in faith, believing he's going to do something. Sometimes when we come to prayer, it's more of out of our rote exercise. It's like, oh, I suppose I should, I should pray about this. You know, I always tease people about we come to prayer meeting and we pray for Aunt Matilda's sore toe. We've been praying for that thing for 21 years and we don't expect God to ever do a thing about it, but we're going to be faithful to pray for Aunt Matilda's sore toe. But we ought to pray. We ought to pray boldly. We ought to pray boldly in faith. And we ought to pray in Jesus' name as Jesus teaches us. When we come to him, we bow our knee to the one who has the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's Philippians 2. Um, but the point is, that when we come to Him, we bow our knee to Him. We pray for His will to be done, for His kingdom to come. We were just singing about that. That's another way of saying basically the same thing. God, let Your will be done, let Your kingdom come on earth as it already is being done in heaven. And so as we're praying, we're praying in Jesus' name. And that's not just tacking something on the end. It means that when we come to Him, we are submitted to His will. And it also means something about the authority that is ours in Jesus Christ. That we are His sons and daughters. And as Ephesians tells us, we are seated with Him in the heavenly realms. And that's the place from where you can pray. Now, I don't have time to go into that, but I would love to teach on that one sometime. <sighs> God often asks, God often um, answers these prayers simply and quickly. Not always, but sometimes immediately. One of my favorite books about prayer, actually, you should, I don't know if you've ever read the autobiography of George Mueller. You should. Or if you want the short version, you could just read his answers to prayer. Now, they're almost, no, this is a short version of his autobiography. But somebody went back and compiled the answers to prayer. And guess what they found out? Mueller had over 50,000 specific recorded answers to prayer. 50,000 that he could document that were in his journals. That he had prayed about specifically and he could say, God answered that prayer specifically. 30,000 of them were answered the same day or about the same hour that he prayed them. So think about that. 30,000 of the 50,000 prayers that he documents in his journals were answered in hours or within the same day when he prayed them. Now, what kind of prayers was he praying? Do you know this guy's story? He had orphanages, multiple orphanages, up to, he had sometimes thousands of children in these orphanages, and um, this is back, it's kind of the same time period where you get Charles Dickens and if you ever read some of those books like Oliver Twist and some of those, where it talks about the orphans and the poverty of the day. Well, he had such a burden for these orphans, and he started, started all these orphanages. Completely on faith, he never asked anyone for money, never sent out a fundraising letter. He only prayed about it. And God kept on answering prayers. You will see stories about how they sat down at the table. There wasn't anything for anybody to eat yet. And they prayed the prayer. And somebody knocked at the door and brought food for everybody. You 
will find it. And these are true stories. This was a man of incredible faith, and God answered prayer over and over and over and over again. There are other people I could point you to, praying Hyde, Reese Howells, um, in our own day, just passed away, Wesley Duell, um, Armand Gesswine. These are men that, some of which I've known, and some of them are long gone. But these are people who prayed on a daily basis, saw God answer prayers, very specifically, and without any doubt that it was God who had done it. Um, if we were to adjust what he did through today's dollars, God funneled over a half a billion dollars through his hands in answer to prayer. Never, never once a fundraising letter. Never once appealing to another person. Only praying to God and asking. 50,000 recorded answers to prayer. Some people think God doesn't answer prayer. George Mueller is a, a pretty powerful case that he does on a regular basis. See, the promise here is that the one who asks receives. And Jesus has some wonderful things to say about this. He said, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son, in John 14, 13. In John 15, 16, he said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Those are amazing promises. Now, they're not without condition. We have to pray in his name. We have to pray in faith. There are certain conditions there. It's not that God always gives us exactly what we pray in the timing that we would like. Often he does cause us to wait. Sometimes he says no. But he does answer one way or another. Or maybe in a process where our, our prayer is refined over the course of time. And then eventually is, he answers the prayer. In any case... Asking is all about looking to God in faith and believing He's going to do something about it. It's not just going through the motions. John 16, 23, In that day you'll no longer ask me anything. For very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask. In my name. Fascinating. John 16, 24, Until now you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you'll receive, and your joy will be complete. 26, In that day you'll ask in my name, and I'm not saying that I will ask the Father. So, in all of these, what we see are these astounding, amazing promises about God wanting to answer our prayers. Wanting to, to give us the thing that we have asked for. And sometimes I think we get so hung up on the conditions or our own experiences that we fail to appreciate how incredible these promises really, really are. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask, or even imagine. Are you imaginative? Are you creative? When I was a kid, I was always on the creative, imaginative side, and I still am. But God can do anything beyond what I can ask, or even I could even think of anything I could imagine. To him be the glory of the church and in Christ Jesus through it, all generations forever and ever. Amen. There have been times in my life where I've prayed a simple prayer and God has answered it specifically, immediately. And I knew it. I have prayed for people. I prayed for people that said, you know what, when you were praying for me, I felt, I felt it was like electricity went through me and I knew immediately I was healed. Now, it doesn't happen every time I pray for people. I wish it did. But on occasion... You get the immediate one. And those are wonderful. They're, it's like, thank you, Lord. Um, one of my favorite ones, I just want to give you a couple stories here. Um, when I was in Ohio, we felt the burden of God to plant a church, to reach out to the Indian community, the people coming from India. We lived in an area between Cincinnati and Dayton where thousands of people were coming from India that were working for uh, people like LexisNexis and NCR, a bunch of electronics companies. It was right around Y2K, so they were hiring engineers like crazy, and we had thousands of these engineers that were coming into our area, and we had a burden for that. God sent a pastor to us who was working as PhD at Asbury Seminary, and we God just pulled it together in an unusual way. I don't have time for that story, 
But what I will tell you is just one story about it. There's so many miracles that happen in this. But the one, we were, we, we took our burden to our district representative and we said, we want to do something about this, but we don't have the money. We don't have the resources, but we have the desire and we'll pray and we'll do everything we can to help. And they said, you go out and do the demographic work. You need to find out how many people there are, where they are, you know, just, they gave us a whole list of stuff we had to put together. And so we prayed about it. We went to a couple of, Mex or Mexican, of Indian restaurants that we knew about and started to ask around where the Indian people were. And they told us about this temple in Cincinnati. And they said, you maybe should go down to the temple in Cincinnati. They could probably give you the answers that you need. And so we did. One day, Promote and I went down. Indian guy, me. Okay? <laughs> the Hindu temple looks like this. this. They have 100 acres of land. And they have plans for every inch of it. Um, we went to this uh, Hindu temple. And before we went in, we prayed. We prayed for God's protection over us. Um, and we prayed that God would lead us to get the information that we needed. The specific information that we needed for the report that we had to do. And guess what happened? We walked in the side door and into the basement. There's a basement to this facility. And they were having, uh, a bunch of Malay people were having a uh, lunch. And um, so we went in there and we immediately met a doctor and two engineers and a lawyer. And they took us to their master plan. The first thing they did is, they said to me, have you, sh or to promote, have you shown him our master plan? First thing. So they took us over and they showed us every detail of this master plan for 100 acres of land. And where, they gave us a map showing us where the people were, about how many people were in each of these neighborhoods, and what the plans were for the next 20 years. Exactly what we needed to find out in an instant. And they were so happy to tell us. They're telling this white guy, and really, you know, it's pretty impressive what we've got planned here. And it was pretty impressive. Their goal was to be the hub of Hindu activity in America. And it was close to the airport, and there was all kinds of things that went along with it. But we found out exactly what we needed that day. And then they said, well, if you want to find out more, go talk to our head priest. So we went upstairs, and we went inside, and just to show you what it looks like on the inside, um, there's a lot of gold and a lot of these crazy images that people worship there, or at least um, they represent, they think they're gods. In any case, we talked to the priest, and guess what? He gave us even more information, and he gave us his newsletters from volume one all the way to the present day, which were filled with information that were needed for the reports that we're putting together. It all happened immediately, within an hour or two. There are times when God answers the prayer specifically in ways that go beyond your imagination, and immediately, there are other times He causes us to wait. <laughs> That's where seeking comes in. Seek. Jesus says, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you will find. Seeking is prayer that presses in. It's, it's when we, we don't find the answer right away, but we, we feel that we have to continue praying for this. We know that this is something God has laid on our hearts and we need to press in and we need to keep on praying and not give up praying about this. <clears throat> A lot of people have family members who just have walked away or who don't know the Lord. And this is where seeking comes in. We pray and we pray and we seek and we keep on seeking. We press in to the heart of God. Seeking is a more intensified form of praying than asking. Seeking implies greater earnestness, perseverance, and hunger and desire, said Wesley Duell. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me half-heartedly. No. With all your heart. With all your heart. With all that is within you. When you seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. 
Psalm 119, verse 2. Blessed are they who seek Him with all their heart. My heart says of you, seek His face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Psalm 27, 8. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 27, 14. Wait patiently for Him. Verse 37, Psalm 37, verse 7. Some of those passages that talk about seeking the Lord, and there are others, I just... Those are some of my favorites. But the interesting thing about seeking is this. Well, let me just put it up here first. First of all, there's an added intensity to your desire or your fervency. You're praying about something, and it's one thing to ask about it. It's another thing to seek God for something. There's an added dimension of desire to see God do something, and added fervency to your praying. It's like, God, I want this, and I'm not going to give up about it. It's almost a stubbornness, if you will, a holy stubbornness. You continue to persist until you find the point of seeking. Have you ever played hide and seek? What's the point? To find, right? You don't just go out and look around. You're looking for something, and you're, you don't stop until you find, right? So it is. And here the focus shifts from the thing that you want to God himself. The focus shifts from God's hand, if you will, to his face. There's something about that in the process. A.B. Simpson, another man of prayer that I always liked, his book Life of Prayer says this, prayer is not asking for things so much as it is a seeking for God himself and pressing into that fellowship that is beyond all other gifts. This is that which carries with it every other blessing. So in other words, seek the Lord, not the blessing. And guess what happens? That the blessing comes. Seek Him first. I think that's true. When we're seeking, it's not so much we're seeking hard for the thing we want to see, as much as we're seeking the Lord. We're seeking to know Him. And in that process, He often blesses us with the answer. The one, the promise is the one who seeks and keeps seeking. Again, present tense imperative. Seek and keep on seeking. You don't give up until you find. You seek and keep on seeking until you find. And he says the one who does seek and keeps on seeking will find. Um, in my own life, probably the best illustration of this is um, finding Malou. Now, that's a true story. Um, We've told you, I think, some of the story of how I found Malou, but I literally, at a certain point in my life, um, got on my knees before God and said, I never seem to get things right, so I'm relying on you to bring the right person into my life. And so I began to do something. I began to pray, and I went through the Bible several times, looking for promises and looking for God to show me what was important in a spouse. And I began to journal it. Every day that was a part of my prayer life. And as I would read through the scripture every day, there would be promises God would give me. A couple of them are right here. He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. A wife of noble character who can find she is worth far more than rubies. Prayed these thousands of times. And lots of other ones. I mean, I could, I could show you pages about like that. A whole section in my prayer journal. Because I, the Lord made me wait. I waited for a long time. I prayed almost 10 years on this. Before I saw the answer. And in the process, guess what happened? I was seeking the Lord. And I was getting to know Him better in the process. You see, when we seek for something important. And we keep on seeking for it. We find more of God in the process. We get to know Him better. We get to know His heart. We get to know what's important to Him and what His will is about a thing. And some of the things that seem so important to you at the beginning don't seem so important at the end. And you will find that there are things that you never thought of at the beginning that He brings in, and those become so important to you. I'll never forget the day I was out prayer walking after journaling. I was out walking around the mall in Middletown, Ohio, and this thought popped into my head. Sometimes these things happen. And I was just praying about this particular need, and the Lord said to me, I'm convinced it was the Lord. You can say I'm crazy. But it was this thought. Three times in your life, 
people have told you you should marry someone from the Philippines. Yes, there's real. I'm sure I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> so I kept walking. I went back to my place. And I went to my computer and checked my email. And I got this crazy fundraising letter that day, within an hour of that particular thing, from this missionary, Campus Crusade missionary, from where? The Philippines. In reading the letter, I found out that she was single, because she did mention that. Um, and I knew she was from the Philippines, and I just had this crazy thought. There have been three times in your life you've had people tell you you should marry someone from the Philippines. And it was true. There was the president of the denomination I was a part of from the Philippines, a Filipino, came to our church along with the delegation. And that was the first person who told me that I should seriously consider going to the Philippines to find a wife because there were many godly women there. And they're beautiful and they're your height. <laughs> <laughs> serious. I am totally serious about that. And I have two missionaries who later came to church and told me the same thing. Exactly, almost word for word. And so when I thought about it, it's true, three times. I had never put it together before that moment, but there it was. I said, Lord. And then I'm looking at this email thinking, Lord, what about this? And it made me scratch my head, whatever remaining years were there, and think. And I said, you know, I ought to at least answer. And so I did. I didn't volunteer a monetary support at the time. I, but I agreed to pray for her. Later, she agreed to pray for me. We began to share prayer requests back and forth. And in the process, we got to know each other. And guess what I found out? Those things that I was journaling about, I began to realize I could check them off. God was answering prayer. The more I got to know her, the more I could see God's heart in this thing. So there came a point where I made a trip to the Philippines. That was a long trip, and I didn't know how it would turn out. But there was a trip to the Philippines, and I met her family, met a bunch of other people. Um, and then there were two other trips before it was all said and done. But after three trips to the Philippines, she made a trip here, and we got married within three months because it was a fiancé visa. You know all those things go. Crazy immigration system. Um, now, her whole story is a totally different one. God used some pretty fantastic things to grab her attention. Our story is very strange, it's unusual, but on both sides, there was journaling, there was praying over the course of time, and God confirming it over the course of time, that this was his choice. I would have never thought to look in the Philippines to find her. How am I going to seek for something in the Philippines? I wouldn't know to go there. But God is able to to bring people together. He's able to do things like that. If we seek Him, we will find. Seek Him. I'd love to tell you more of the story, but that's as much as I have time for. I got another point. Knock. Knock. These are prayers that refuse to give up. Jesus said sometimes you ask, sometimes you seek, and keep seeking, and sometimes you got to knock on the door until your knuckles bleed. You don't give up until somebody opens the door. That's the duel. At times your seeking becomes so urgent, your soul so desperate, that you actually begin to knock at heaven's door. And when the need is crying for God's answer, but the answer is still not coming, and when your soul is also crying out to God in holy desperation, it is not irreverent to knock at the entrance to heaven's door. Jesus said in Luke 11, 5, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me. I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Um, Jesus is teaching us to knock on the door until we receive the answer. Don't give up. Shameless audacity. That's faith. Faith. Perseverity. Faith. Not me. Simpson again. This is more than seeking. 
It is so much the prayer that knocks at the gates of heavens and extorts an answer from an... Un it says it's not so much the prayer that knocks at the gates of heaven and tries to extort an answer from an unwilling God. That's not the picture. It's the prayer which, having received the answer and promise, carries it forth against the gates of the enemy and beats them down as the walls of Jericho fell before the trump and shout of Israel's believing hosts. It is faith putting its hands on the omnipotence of God and using it in fellowship with our own omnipotent head until we see his name prevail against all that opposes his will and the crooked things are made straight and the gates of brass are open and the fetters of iron are broken asunder. Sometimes there's a spiritual battle that takes place. Daniel talked about that. He said the prayer was delayed for 21 days. Why? Because there was a battle going on in the heavens. There are times where God, so willing to give us the answer, is waiting for the right time. And there's actually a battle taking place somehow. I don't, exp I don't understand it all. I just know that that's what it tells us. And those times we knock. We keep on knocking. We keep on pressing in. We keep on asking. Here, desire has moved past fervency to desperate cries for help. This is where the audacious faith that refuses to give up comes in. This is where we persevere until the door opens. I've gone with Malou a couple times lately to visit houses. You know, she's a real estate agent now. And sometimes we go in to look at houses and you put the little card in and it opens up the lockbox and then you get the key and go in. On occasion you're surprised. Usually there's nobody there. A couple times there's been somebody there that, whoa, wasn't expecting that. When we knock, amazing things begin to happen. I love this story. I don't have time for it, but Acts chapter 12. Read it for yourself. Remember when Peter is in, put in prison and, they, and the people all gather to pray for him. And what happens? He gets out of prison. There's an earthquake. An angel leads him, the whole thing. And Peter's knocking on the door of the prayer meeting. And Rhoda, the servant girl, comes. And she thinks she's seen a ghost. Because she it couldn't be Peter. It couldn't be him. And so he keeps she shuts the door on his face. He keeps knocking on the door. They here at the same time there's a prayer meeting, intensely praying for his release, fearing that he might be killed. And he's knocking at the door and they keep on praying. It's comical, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. But isn't that not the way prayer sometimes is? And you know, they should they had expectation, I'm sure, but they couldn't believe it with their own eyes when they saw the answer. Oh, may that challenge us. Keep knocking. Jesus said, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with that person. Sometimes Jesus is knocking at our door. So I want to come in and have fellowship with you. Where have you been? Sometimes you've got to keep knocking. George Mueller again. When he was a young convert, when he first came to Christ, he began praying daily for five of his closest friends to come to know Christ as their Savior. Two of the friends became Christians within two years of him starting to pray for them. It just took two years of prayer for those two. But it seemed as if his prayers for the remaining three friends would never be answered. But they were. One of those men was converted about 10 years after he started praying for him. The fourth was apparently converted just before Mueller died. And probably at the occasion of Mueller's last sermon, he came to know Christ. The fifth man that he prayed for all of his life was converted within a year of George Mueller's funeral. He never saw that one with his own eyes. But all five of them came to know Christ because George Mueller had been praying for him for more than 60 years. This great man of faith who saw 30,000 instant answers to prayer, this one he had prayed for for 60 years. Don't give up. The hardest cases, the people you would never expect, those that go beyond your ability to think or imagine. Don't give up. Persevere. Knock. Knock. Keep on knocking. And 
Be filled with hope and expectation at what's behind the door. Don't ever give up. Sometime, I, one last illustration. When I came here, I had to knock for a while. Um, I, I was teaching. I'd gone back to work on my doctorate and all that kind of stuff. And, and um, in the process, we decided that um, I was going to get back into the pastor. I just felt called by God that that's what I needed to do. God took me on this strange little wilderness detour where I ended up teaching in this Korean school, and then they wanted me to be the dean and do all the administrative stuff, which I hated. I, I loved the teaching, but I did not like the administration. I was working in a strange multicultural environment where I was one of the few people who English was the first language, and so there was a lot of confusion all the time, always things were, it was a strange place. God used it for a time, but I sensed in my spirit that he had something he was going to open. And Malou and I would go prayer walking and we would go praying together. There were times we would cry out to God, God, open the door. And several times it looked like a door was going to open. I can think of this church in San Jose, for example, that we correspond with. And I did more paperwork for that church than you can ever imagine. Literally 200 and some questions one time. And I mean, it was crazy. And it came down to, I think there were three of us at the end that were left. And it was a process that went, I think, over did it go a year, I can't mm -hmm. remember, oh, something like that. And then at the last minute, they hired the interim pastor instead of the three candidates. <laughs> it's like, it like you thought God was moving in a direction. It seems it made sense. And then it was like the it's like the floor dropped out. It's like, okay, God, where are you in this? You've been there, right? You prayed for something. It looked like God was going to answer it. And then look, it, it totally did not turn out the way you wanted to. So what do you do? You keep on knocking. And finally you'll find some crazy church up in the mountains who <laughs> actually believe you when you say you want to go back and pastor. <laughs> well, there's more I could say about that. But I better stop the last point, and it's so, it's just this. The whole basis for this thing is this. God is good. And he's always going to give you what's best. Always. He is not one who is unwilling to give good gifts. He loves to give good gifts. There are times he plays hide and seek with us. Okay? And the point of hide and seek is the joy of finding. When you get to the end, and you find Oh, there's great joy, just like when you're, you found your dad and he was crawled in some closet someplace. So, in your heavenly, you find him. There's great joy in that. The reason we can pray in faith believing, the reason we can ask and keep asking, that we can seek and keep seeking, that we can knock and keep knocking, is that God is a loving Father who will always give us what's good. Always give us what is best. He may say, no. He may say, Wait, he may say, keep seeking me as you refine your request in line with his will. He may say, keep on knocking as we demonstrate our faith and our fervency. But his disposition is to say, yes, yes, and so much more. If you ask for a fish, he won't give you a snake. There's a kind of catfish in the Sea of Galilee that looks kind of like a snake. That's probably what he's thinking about there. Bread sometimes kind of looks like a rock. He says, he says, if you ask God for fish, he's not going to give you a snake. If you ask God for a rock, a rock? No, you're not going to ask him for a rock. You're going to ask him for bread. Bread and fish were what? The basic staples of their existence. Give us today our daily bread. Give us our fish, our bread. He's not going to give us snake. He's not going to give us rocks instead of bread. He's going to give us what we need. So when you ask God something, he sometimes he doesn't like to do it right away for some reason. That's his own business. But if you wait, he'll get there. Keep asking. Keep 
asking, seeking, knocking, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Pray with expectancy, with fervent desire, with bold faith. And remember your God is a God of hope and a loving Heavenly Father who wants what is good and what is best for you. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you.